The Lotus Sutra Chapter 1 Introduction This is what I heard. At one time the Buddha was in Rajagriha, staying on Mount Grirakita. Accompanying him were a multitude of leading monks numbering 12,000 persons. All were arots whose outflows had come to an end, who had no more earthly desires, who had attained what was to their advantage and had put an end to the bonds of existence, and whose minds had achieved a state of freedom. Their names were Ajnata, Kaundanya, Mahakashyapa, Uruvilva Kashyapa, Gaya Kashyapa, Nadi Kashyapa, Shuruputra, Great Morgalyarana, Mahakatyarana, Aniruddha, Kapina, Gavampati, Reveta, Pilindavatsa, Bakula, Mahakoshthala, Nanda, Sundarananda, Purna, son of Maitreani, Subhuti, Ananda, and Rayala. All were like these, great arots who were well known to others. There were also two thousand persons some of whom were still learning and some who had completed their learning. There was the nun Mahaprajapati with her six thousand followers. And there was Rayala's mother, the nun Yashodara, with her followers. There were Bodhisattvas Mahasattva, eighty thousand of them, none of them ever regressing in their search for supreme perfect enlightenment. All had gained Dharanis, delighted in preaching, were eloquent, and turned the wheel of the law that knows no regression. They had made offerings to immeasurable hundreds and thousands of Buddhas, in the presence of various Buddhas had planted numerous roots of virtue, had been constantly praised by the Buddhas, had trained themselves in compassion, were good at entering the Buddha wisdom, and had fully penetrated the great wisdom and reached the farther shore. Their fame had spread throughout immeasurable worlds and they were able to save countless hundreds of thousands of living beings. Their names were Bodhisattva Manjushri, Bodhisattva Perceiver of the World's Sounds, Bodhisattva Gainer of Great Authority, Bodhisattva Constant Exertion, Bodhisattva Never Resting, Bodhisattva Jeweled Palm, Bodhisattva Medicine King, Bodhisattva Brave Donor, Bodhisattva Jeweled Moon, Bodhisattva Moonlight, Bodhisattva Full Moon, Bodhisattva Great Strength, Bodhisattva Immeasurable Strength, Bodhisattva Transcending the Threefold World, Bodhisattva Bhadrapala, Bodhisattva Maitreya, Bodhisattva Jeweled Accumulation, and Bodhisattva Guiding Leader. Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas such as these numbering 80,000 were in attendance. At that time the heavenly king Chakra with his followers, 20,000 sons of gods, also attended. There were also the sons of gods rare moon, pervading fragrance, jeweled glow, and the four great heavenly kings, along with their followers, 10,000 sons of gods. Present were the sons of gods freedom and great freedom and their followers, 30,000 sons of gods. Present were King Brahma, Lord of the Sahar world, the great Brahma Shikhin, and the great Brahma Light Bright, and their followers, 12,000 sons of gods. There were eight dragon kings, the dragon king Nanda, the dragon king Upananda, the dragon king Sagara, the dragon king Vajuki, the dragon king Takshaka, the dragon king Anavatapta, the dragon king Manasvin and the dragon king Utpalaka, each with several hundreds of thousands of followers. There were four Kimra kings, the Kimra king law, the Kimra king wonderful law, the Kimra king great law, and the Kimra king upholding the law, each with several hundreds of thousands of followers. There were four Gandharva kings, the Gandharva king pleasant, the Gandharva king pleasant sound, the Gandharva King Beautiful, and the Gandharva King Beautiful Sound, each with several hundreds of thousands of followers. There were four Asura Kings, the Asura King Balan, the Asura King Karaskanda, the Asura King Vemashitrin, 
and the Asura King Ryu, each with several hundreds of thousands of followers. There were four Garuda Kings, the Garuda King Great Majesty, the Garuda King Great Body, the Garuda King Great Fullness, and the Garuda King as One Wishes, each with several hundreds of thousands of followers. And there was King Ajata Shatru, the son of Vedai, with several hundreds of thousands of followers. Each of these, after bowing in obeisance before the Buddha's feet, withdrew and took a seat to one side. At that time the world honored one, surrounded by the four kinds of believers, received offerings and tokens of respect and was honored and praised. And for the sake of the Bodhisattvas he preached the great vehicle sutra entitled Immeasurable Meanings, a teaching to instruct the Bodhisattvas, one that is guarded and kept in mind by the Buddhas. When the Buddha had finished preaching this sutra, he sat with his legs crossed in the lotus position and entered into the samadhi of the origin of immeasurable meanings. His body and mind never moving. At that time heaven rained down Mandarava flowers, great Mandarava flowers, Manjushaka flowers, and great Manjushaka flowers, scattering them over the Buddha and over the great assembly. And everywhere the Buddha world quaked and trembled in six different ways. At that time the monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, the heavenly beings, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, Garadas, Kimnaras, Mauragas, the human and non-human beings in the assembly. And the petty kings and wheel-turning sage kings, all these in the great assembly, having gained what they had never had before, were filled with joy and, pressing their palms together, gazed at the Buddha with a single mind. At that time the Buddha emitted a ray of light from the tuft of white hair between his eyebrows, one of his characteristic features, lighting up 18,000 worlds in the eastern direction. There was no place that the light did not penetrate, reaching downward as far as the Avicii hells and upward to the Akanish the heavens. From this world one could see the living beings in the six paths of existence in all of those other lands. One could likewise see the Buddhas present at that time in those other lands and could hear the Sutra teachings that those Buddhas were expounding. At the same time one could see the monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen who were carrying out religious practices and attaining the way. One could also see the Bodhisattvas Mahasattva who, through various causes and conditions and various types of faith and understanding and in various forms and aspects, were carrying out the way of the Bodhisattva. And one could also see the Bodhas who had entered Parinirvana, and could also see how, after the Bodhas had entered Parinirvana, towers adorned with the seven treasures were being erected for the Buddha relics. At that time Bodhisattva Maitreya had this thought, now the world honored one has manifested these miraculous signs. But what is the cause of these auspicious portents? Now the Buddha, the world honored one, has entered into Samadhi. An unfathomable event such as this is seldom to be met with. Whom shall I question about this? Who can give me an answer? And again he had this thought, this Manjushri, son of a Dharma king, has already personally attended and given offerings to immeasurable numbers of Buddhas in the past. Surely he must have seen these rare signs before. I will now question him. At this time the monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, and the heavenly beings, dragons, spirits, and others all had this thought. This beam of brightness from the Buddha, these signs of transcendental powers, now whom shall we question about them? At that time Bodhisattva Maitreya wished to settle his doubts concerning the matter. And in addition he could see what was in the minds of the four kinds of believers, the monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, and the heavenly beings, dragons, spirits.
and others who made up the assembly. So he questioned Manjushri, saying, What is the cause of these auspicious portents, these signs of transcendental powers? This emitting of a great beam of brightness that illumines the 18,000 lands in the eastern direction, so we can see all the adornments of the Buddha worlds there. Then Bodhisattva Maitreya, wishing to state his meaning once more, asked the question in verse form, Manjushri, why from the white tuft between the eyebrows of our leader and teacher, does this great light shine all around? Why do Mandarava and Manjushaka flowers rain down, and breezes scented with sandalwood, delight the hearts of the assembly? Because of these, the earth is everywhere adorned and purified, and this world quakes and trembles in six different ways. At this time the four kinds of believers, are all filled with joy and delight, they rejoice in body and mind, having gained what they never had before. The beam of brightness from, between the eyebrows, illumines the eastern direction, and 18,000 lands, are all the color of gold. From the Avicii hells, upward to the summits of being, throughout the various worlds. The living beings in the six paths, where their births and deaths are tending, their good and bad deeds, and the pleasing or ugly recompense they receive, all these can be seen from here. We can also see Buddhas, those sage lords, lions, expounding and preaching sutras, that are subtle, wonderful, and foremost. Their voices are clear and pure, issuing in soft and gentle sounds, as they teach bodhisattvas, in numberless millions. Their Brahma sounds are profound and wonderful, making people delight in hearing them. Each in his own world, preaches the correct teaching, following various causes and conditions, and employing immeasurable similes, illuminating the Buddhist law. Guiding living beings to enlightenment. If a person should encounter troubles, loathing aging, sickness, and death, the Buddhas preach to him on nirvana, explaining how he may put an end to all troubles. If a person should have good fortune, having in the past made offerings to the Buddhas, determined to seek a superior teaching, the Buddhas preach the way of the cause awakened one. If there should be Buddha sons, who carry out various religious practices, seeking to attain the unsurpassed wisdom, the Buddhas preach the way of purity. Manjushri, I have been dwelling here, seeing and hearing in this manner many things numbering in the thousands of millions. Numerous as they are, I will now speak of them in brief. I see in these lands, bodhisattvas numerous as Ganges' sons, according with various causes and conditions, and seeking the way of the Buddha. Some of them give arms, gold, silver, coral, pearls, many jewels, seashell, agate, diamonds, and other rarities, men and women servants, carriages, jeweled hand carriages and palanquins. Gladly presenting these donations. Advancing towards the Buddha way, their desire is to achieve this vehicle, that is foremost in the threefold world, and praised by the Buddhas. There are some Bodhisattvas, who give jeweled carriages drawn by teams of four, with railings and flowered canopies, adorning their tops and sides. Again I see bodhisattvas, who give their own flesh, hands, and feet, or their wives and children, seeking the unsurpassed way. I also see bodhisattvas, who happily give, heads, eyes, bodies, and limbs, in their search for the Buddha wisdom. Manjushri, I see kings going to visit the place of the Buddha, to ask him about the unsurpassed way. They put aside their happy lands, their palaces, their men and women attendants, shave their hair and beards, and don the clothes of the Dharma. Or I see bodhisattvas, 
who become monks, living alone in quietude, delighting in chanting the sutras. Again I see bodhisattvas, bravely and vigorously exerting themselves, entering the deep mountains, their thoughts on the Buddha way. And I see them removing themselves from desire, constantly dwelling in emptiness and stillness, advancing deep into the practice of meditation, till they have gained the five transcendental powers. And I see bodhisattvas, resting in meditation, palms pressed together, with a thousand, ten thousand verses, praising the king of the doctrines. Again I see bodhisattvas, profound in wisdom, firm in purpose, who know how to question the Buddhas, and accept and abide by all they hear. I see Buddha sons, proficient in both meditation and wisdom, who use immeasurable numbers of similes, to expound the law to the assembly, delighting in preaching the law, converting the bodhisattvas, defeating the legions of the devil, and beating the Dharma drum. And I see bodhisattvas, profoundly still and silent, honored by heavenly beings and dragons, but not counting that a joy. And I see bodhisattvas, living in forests, emitting light, saving those who suffer in hell, causing them to enter the Buddha way. And I see Buddha sons, who have never once slept, who keep circling through the forest, diligently seeking the Buddha way. And I see those who observe the precepts, no flaw in their conduct, pure as jewels and gems, and in that manner seeking the Buddha way. And I see Buddha sons, abiding in the strength of fortitude, taking the abuse and blows, of persons of overbearing arrogance, willing to suffer all these, and in that manner seeking the Buddha way. I see Bodhisattvas, removing themselves from frivolity and laughter, and from foolish companions, befriending persons of wisdom, unifying their minds, dispelling confusion, ordering their thoughts in mountain and forest, and for a million, a thousand, ten thousand years, in that manner seeking the Buddha way. Or I see bodhisattvas, with delicious things to eat and drink, and a hundred kinds of medicinal potions, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. Fine robes and superior garments, costing in the thousands or ten thousands, or robes that are beyond cost, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. A thousand, ten thousand, a million kinds, of jeweled dwellings made of sandalwood and numerous wonderful articles of bedding, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. Immaculate gardens and groves, where flowers and fruit abound, flowing springs and bathing pools, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. Offerings of this kind, of many different wonderful varieties, presented gladly and without regret, as they seek the unsurpassed way. Or there are bodhisattvas, who expound the doctrine of tranquil extinction, giving different types of instruction, to numberless living beings. Or I see bodhisattvas, viewing the nature of all phenomena, as having no dual characteristics, as being like empty space. And I see bodhisattvas, whose minds have no attachments, who use this wonderful wisdom, to seek the unsurpassed way. Manjushri, there are also bodhisattvas, who after the Buddha has passed into extinction, make offerings to his relics. I see Buddha sons, building memorial towers, as numberless as Ganges sons, ornamenting each land with them, jeweled towers lofty and wonderful, five thousand yojanas high, their width and depth. Exactly two thousand yojanas. Each of these memorial towers, with its thousand banners and streamers, with curtains laced with gems like dewdrops, and jeweled bells chiming harmoniously. Their heavenly beings, dragons, human and non-human beings, with incense, flowers, and music, constantly make offerings. Manjushri, these Buddha sons, 
in order to make offerings to the relics, adorn the memorial towers, so that each land, just as it is, is as outstandingly wonderful and lovely. As the heavenly king of trees, when its flowers open and unfold. When the Buddha emits a beam of light, I and the other members of the assembly, can see these lands, in all their various outstanding wonders. The supernatural powers of the Buddhas, and their wisdom are rare indeed, by emitting one pure beam of light, the Buddhas illuminate countless lands. I and the others have seen this, have gained something never known before. Buddha son, Manjushri, I beg you to settle the doubts of the assembly. The four kinds of believers look up in happy anticipation, gazing at you and me. Why does the world honored one, emit this beam of brightness? Buddha son, give a timely answer, settle these doubts and occasion joy. What rich benefits will come, from the projecting of this beam of brightness? It must be that the Buddha wishes to expound, the wonderful law he gained, when he sat in the place of enlightenment. He must have prophesied to bestow. He has shown us Buddha lands, with their adornment and purity of manifold treasures, and we have seen their Buddhas, this is not done for petty reasons. Manjushri, you must know. The four kinds of believers and the dragons, gaze at you in surmise, wondering what explanation you will give. At that time Manjushri said to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya and the other great men. Good men, I suppose that the Buddha, the world-honored one, wishes now to expound the great law, to rain down the rain of the great law, to blow the conch of the great law. To beat the drum of the great law, to elucidate the meaning of the great law. Good men, in the past I have seen this auspicious portent among the Buddhas. They emitted beams of light like this, and after that they expounded the great law. Therefore we should know that now, when the present Buddha manifests this light, he will do likewise. He wishes to cause all living beings to hear and understand the law, which is difficult for all the world to believe. Therefore he has manifested this auspicious portent. Good men, once, at a time that was an immeasurable, boundless, inconceivable number of Azamkhaya Kalpas in the past, there was a Buddha named Sun Moon Bright, thus come one, worthy of offerings of right and universal knowledge, perfect clarity and conduct, well gone, understanding the world, unexcelled worthy, trainer of people, teacher of heavenly and human beings, Buddha. World honored one, who expounded the correct teachings. His exposition was good at the beginning, good in the middle, good at the end. The meaning was profound and far-reaching, the words were skillful and wondrous. It was pure and without alloy, complete, clean, and spotless, and bore the marks of Brahma practice. For the sake of those seeking to become voice hearers, he responded by expounding the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths, so that they could transcend birth, aging, sickness, and death and attain nirvana. For the sake of those seeking to become Pratyekabodhas he responded by expounding the doctrine of the twelve linked chain of causation. For the sake of the Bodhisattvas he responded by expounding the six parameters, causing them to gain supreme perfect enlightenment and to acquire the wisdom that embraces all species. Then there was another Buddha who was also named Sun Moon Bright and then another Buddha also named Sun Moon Bright. There were 20,000 Buddhas like this, all with the same appellation, all named Sun Moon Bright. And all had the same surname, the surname Bharadvaja. 
Maitreya, you should understand that from the first Buddha to the last, all had the same appellation, all were named Sun Moon Bright. They were worthy of all the ten epithets and the teachings they expounded were good at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. The last Buddha, when he had not yet left family life, had eight princely sons. The first was named having intention, the second good intention, the third immeasurable intention, the fourth jeweled intention, the fifth increased intention, the sixth cleansed of doubt intention, the seventh echoing intention, and the eighth law intention. Dignity and virtue came easily to them, and each presided over a four-continent realm. When these princes heard that their father had left family life and had gained supreme perfect enlightenment, they all cast aside their princely positions and followed him by leaving family life. Conceiving a desire for the great vehicle, they constantly carried out Brahma practices, and all became teachers of the law. They had already planted good roots in the company of a thousand, ten thousand Buddhas. At that time the Buddha Sun Moon Bright preached the Great Vehicle Sutra entitled Immeasurable Meanings, a teaching to instruct the Bodhisattvas, one that is guarded and kept in mind by the Buddhas. When he had finished preaching the Sutra, he sat cross-legged in the midst of the Great Assembly and entered into the Samadhi of the Origin of Immeasurable Meanings, his body and mind never moving. At this time heaven rained down Mandarava flowers, great Mandarava flowers, Manjushaka flowers, and great Manjushaka flowers, scattering them over the Buddha and over the great assembly. And everywhere the Buddha world quaked and trembled in six different ways. At that time the monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, the heavenly beings, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, Asuras, Garadas, Kimnaras, Mauragas, the human and non-human beings in the assembly. And the petty kings and wheel-turning sage kings, all these in the great assembly gained what they had never had before and, filled with joy, pressed their palms together and gazed at the Buddha with a single mind. At that time the thus come one emitted a ray of light from the tuft of white hair between his eyebrows, one of his characteristic features. Lighting up 18,000 Buddha lands in the eastern direction. There was no place that the light did not penetrate, just as you have seen it light up these Buddha lands now. Maitreya, you should understand this. At that time in the assembly there were 20 million bodhisattvas who were happy and eager to hear the law. When these bodhisattvas saw this beam of light that illumined the Buddha lands everywhere, they gained what they had never had before. They wished to know the causes and conditions that had occasioned this light. At that time there was a bodhisattva named Wonderfully Bright who had 800 disciples. At this time the Buddha Sun Moon Bright arose from his Samadhi, and, because of the Bodhisattva Wonderfully Bright, preached the Great Vehicle Sutra called the Lotus of the Wonderful Law. A teaching to instruct the Bodhisattvas, one that is guarded and kept in mind by the Buddhas. For sixty small Kalpas the Buddha remained in his seat without rising, and the listeners in the assembly at that time also remained seated there for sixty small kalpas, their bodies and minds never moving. And yet it seemed to them that they had been listening to the Buddha preach for no more than the space of a meal. At this time in the assembly there was not a single person who in body or mind had the least feeling of weariness. When the Buddha Sun Moon Bright had finished preaching this sutra over a period of sixty small kalpas, he spoke these words to the Brahmas, devils, shramanas, and Brahmins, and to the heavenly and human beings and asuras in the assembly, saying, 
Tonight at midnight the thus come one will enter the nirvana of no remainder. At this time there was a bodhisattva named Virtue Storehouse. The Bodhisattva Moon Bright bestowed a prophecy on him, announcing to the monks, this Bodhisattva Virtue Storehouse will be the next to become a Buddha. He will be called Pure Body, Tathagate, Arat, Samyak Samboda. After the Buddha had finished bestowing this prophecy, at midnight he entered the Nirvana of no remainder. After the Buddha had passed away, Bodhisattva wonderfully bright upheld the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Law, for a period of fully eighty small kalpas expounding it for others. The eight sons of the Bodhisattva Moon Bright all acknowledged Wonderfully Bright as their teacher. Wonderfully Bright taught and converted them and roused in them a firm determination to gain supreme perfect enlightenment. Those princely sons gave offerings to immeasurable hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions of Buddhas, and after that all were able to achieve the Buddha way. The last to become a Buddha was named Burning Torch. Among the eight hundred disciples of Wonderfully Bright was one named Seeker of Fame. He was greedy for gain and support, and though he read and recited numerous sutras, he could not understand them, but for the most part forgot them. Hence he was called Seeker of Fame. Because this man had in addition planted various good roots, however, he was able to encounter immeasurable hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions of Buddhas, to make offerings to them, revere, honor, and praise them. Maitreya, you should understand this. Bodhisattva wonderfully bright who lived then, could he be unknown to you? He was no other than I myself. And Bodhisattva seeker of fame was you. Now when I see this auspicious portent, it is no different from what I saw before. Therefore I suppose that now the thus come one is about to preach the great vehicle sutra, called the Lotus of the Wonderful Law a teaching to instruct the Bodhisattvas. One that is guarded and kept in mind by the Buddhas. At that time Manjushri, wishing in the presence of the great assembly to state his meaning once more, spoke in verse form, saying, I recall that in a past age, immeasurable, innumerable Kalpas ago, there was a Buddha, most honored of men, named Sun Moon Bright. This world-honored one expounded the law, saving immeasurable living beings, and numberless millions of bodhisattvas, causing them to enter the Buddha wisdom. The eight princely sons whom this Buddha sired, before taking leave of family life, when they saw that the great sage had left his family, did likewise, carrying out Brahma practices. At that time the Buddha preached the great vehicle a sutra named Immeasurable Meanings, and in the midst of a great assembly, for the sake of the people broadly made distinctions. When the Buddha had finished preaching this sutra, he sat in the seat of the law, sitting cross-legged in the Samadhi, called the origin of Immeasurable Meanings. The heavens rained mandarava flowers, heavenly drums sounded of themselves, and the heavenly beings, dragons, and spirits, made offerings to the most honored of men. All the Buddha lands, immediately quaked and trembled greatly. The Buddha emitted a light from between his eyebrows, manifesting signs that are rarely seen. This light illumined the eastern direction, 18,000 Buddha lands, showing how all the living beings there, were recompensed in birth and death for their past deeds that one could see how these Buddha lands, adorned with numerous jewels, shone with hues of lapis lazuli and crystal, was due to the illumination of the Buddha's light. One could also see the heavenly and human beings, dragons, many Yakshas, Gandharvas, and Kimnaras, each making offerings to his respective Buddha. One could also see thus come ones, naturally attaining the Buddha way, their bodies the color of golden mountains, upright, imposing, 
very subtle and wonderful. It was as though in the midst of pure lapis lazuli, there should appear statues of real gold. In the midst of the great assembly, the world-honored ones expounded the principles of the profound law. In one after another of the border lands, the voice hearers in countless multitudes, through the illumination of the Buddha's light, all became visible with their great assemblies. There were also monks, residing in the midst of forests, exerting themselves and keeping the pure precepts, as though they were guarding a bright jewel. One could also see bodhisattvas, carrying out almsgiving, forbearance, and so forth, their number like Ganges sons, due to the illumination of the Buddha's light. One could also see bodhisattvas, entering deep into meditation practices, their bodies and minds still and unmoving, in that manner seeking the unsurpassed way. One could also see bodhisattvas, who knew that phenomena, are marked by tranquility and extinction, each in his respective land, preaching the law and seeking the Buddha way. At that time the four kinds of believers, seeing the Buddha sun moon bright, manifest his great transcendental powers, all rejoiced in their hearts, and each one asked his neighbor. What had caused these events? The one honored by heavenly and human beings just then arose from his samadhi, and praised Bodhisattva wonderfully bright, saying, You are the eyes of the world. One whom all can take faith in and believe, able to honor and uphold the storehouse of the law. The law that I preach, you alone can understand and grasp it. The world-honored one, having bestowed this praise, causing wonderfully bright to rejoice, preached the Lotus Sutra. For fully sixty small kalpas. He never rose from this seat, and the supreme and wonderful law that he preached, was accepted and upheld in its entirety, by the teacher of the law wonderfully bright. After the Buddha had preached the lotus, causing all the assembly to rejoice, on that very same day, he announced to the assembly of heavenly and human beings, I have already expounded for you. The meaning of the true aspect of all phenomena. Now when midnight comes, I will enter nirvana. You must strive with all your heart, and remove yourselves from indulgence and laxity. It is very difficult to encounter a Buddha, you meet one once in a million kalpas. When the children of the world honored one, heard that the Buddha was to enter nirvana, each one was filled with sorrow and distress wondering why the Buddha should so quickly seek extinction. The sage lord, king of the law, comforted and reassured the countless multitude, saying, when I enter extinction, you must not be concerned or fearful. This Bodhisattva virtue storehouse, has already fully understood in his mind, the true aspect that is without outflows. He will be next to become a Buddha bearing the name pure body, and he too will save immeasurable multitudes. That night the Buddha entered extinction. As a fire dies out when the firewood is exhausted. They divided and apportioned his relics, and built immeasurable numbers of towers, and the monks and nuns, whose number was like Ganges' sons, redoubled their exertions, thereby seeking the unsurpassed way. This teacher of the law wonderfully bright, honored and upheld the Buddha's storehouse of the law, throughout eighty small kalpas, broadly propagating the Lotus Sutra. These eight princely sons, whom wonderfully bright converted, held firmly to the unsurpassed way, and were thus able to encounter innumerable Buddhas. And after they had made offerings to these Buddhas, they followed them in practicing the great way, and one after the other succeeded in becoming a Buddha. Each in turn bestowing a prophecy on his successor. The last to become a heavenly being among heavenly beings, was named the Buddha Burning Torch. As leader and teacher of seers, he saved immeasurable multitudes. 
This teacher of the law wonderfully bright, at that time had a disciple, whose mind was forever occupied with laziness and sloth, who was greedy for fame and profit. He sought fame and profit insatiably, often amusing himself among clansmen and those of other surnames. He threw away what he had studied and memorized, neglected and forgot it, failed to understand it. Because of this, he was named Seeker of Fame. But he had also carried out many good actions, and thus was able to meet with innumerable bodhas. He made offerings to the bodhas, and followed them in practicing the great way, carrying out all the six parameters, and now he has met the lion of the Shakyas. Hereafter he will become a bodha, whose name will be Maitreya, who will save living beings extensively, in numbers beyond calculation. After that bodha passed into extinction, that lazy and slothful one, he was you and the teacher of the law wonderfully bright, that was the person who is now I myself. I saw how the Buddha torch bright sun moon bright, earlier manifested an auspicious portent like this. And so I know that now the Buddha, is about to preach the Lotus Sutra. The signs now are like those of the earlier auspicious portent, this is an expedient means used by the Buddhas. Now when the Buddha emits this beam of brightness, he is helping to reveal the meaning of the true aspect of phenomena. Human beings now will come to know it. Let us press our palms together and wait with a single mind. The Buddha will rain down the reign of the law, to fully satisfy all seekers of the way. You who seek the three vehicles, if you have doubts and regrets, the Buddha will resolve them for you, bringing them to an end so that nothing remains.